Listening activity number eleven. You will hear an interview between a reporter and an officer from the British Council. As you listen, fill in the gaps and answer the following questions. In recent years, more and more foreign students have been coming to the UK to study. But when they first arrive, many students are unsure of the formalities they have to follow, and even where to go for help. So we have Alan McLean from the British Council here today to offer some advice. Alan, first of all, where do overseas students get help when they have problems at college? Well, the welfare office of the student union can provide students with information and advice on all aspects of college life and living in the UK. The college will also have a counsellor for overseas students. Who will specifically look after the interest of foreign students? They can also put you in touch with overseas student societies and organisations, which are often run by overseas students. So, as you can see, there's quite an extensive support service for the students, and new arrivals shouldn't feel they have to tackle problems alone. Indeed. So, what formalities should students coming from abroad complete upon first arriving? One important thing is to register with the police. The stamp, which will have been put in the student passport by the immigration officer, indicates whether or not they are required to register with the police. If you are from the European Community or the Commonwealth, or if you intend to stay in the United Kingdom for less than six months, you should not have to register with the police. So not all overseas students have to register with the police. But if you are not from an EEC or Commonwealth country, presumably you must register. That's right. If you are required to register with the police, you must do so within seven days of arrival in Britain. You must also inform the police every time you change your address while you are in the United Kingdom. And what do you have to bring for registration? You will need to take your passport, of course, and two passport-sized photographs of yourself. If you are living in London, you should go to Ten Lambs Conduit Street, London WC1. It opens 9 a.m. to 4:45 p.m. Monday to Friday. In other parts of the country, you should go to the nearest police station for advice on where to register. There is a charge of twenty-five pounds for registration. I see. So your passport, two passport-sized photos, and twenty-five pounds. Mm-hmm. Another important thing is that holders of student visas aren't usually entitled to claim state benefit or to work. Attempting to do so may affect your right to stay in the United Kingdom. You might be prosecuted and fined about five hundred pounds. It will say on your visa whether you are entitled to get a job in the UK or not. So that's something non-resident students should be aware of. Working in Britain without permission is a criminal offence. But if they are entitled to get a job in the UK, how do they go about finding one? If you are allowed to work, you will need to get forms O W one and O W five. These can be picked up at any job centre, where work permits for overseas students can now be issued. The O W one form is filled out by your prospective employer. And return to the job centre along with your passport and a letter from your college, indicating that the employment will not interfere with your studies. If you are looking for work experience or practical learning, you must get forms O W twenty one and O W twenty two from the work experience section of the Department of Employment. You will be asked for proof of the purpose and intended length of stay here. And that you are going to return to your native country. Well, I hope that will answer a few questions for overseas students. Thank you very much for coming in, Alan. Listening activity number twelve. You're going to listen to a talk about the student union. As you listen. Fill in the gaps and answer the following questions. Now, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the student union in this college. 
all full-time students automatically belong to the student union and have voting and membership rights, which means you can vote in union meetings and in election for the student officers. Part-time students also have access to what the union has to offer. Further details of this are available from the student union offices. The union is affiliated to the National Union of Students, NUS, which represents students on a nationwide level. Through the student union and its parent body, students can take advantage of reduced price travel facilities, Ensley Insurance, the main student insurance company, and a wide range of reductions on consumer goods through the student discount card. The Social Committee of the Student Union organises dances and other entertainments, including the Folk Club, Womb Cinema, and the Third Eye, which caters for a more developed taste in music, theatre, art and poetry. The Student Union also finances over 20 clubs and societies for a wide range of interests. You can get details of these from the Student Union offices. Listening activity number 13. You are going to hear a conversation between a student and an accommodation officer. As you listen, fill the missing information in the notes below and then indicate whether the following statements are true or false. Now listen to the conversation. Janet has just come down to London for the day. In September, she will be studying at university and she needs to find somewhere to live. Janet goes to an accommodation agency which she knows is offering free advice. Hello, can I help you? Yes, I'm soon to be studying here in London and I need to find somewhere to live. OK, have a seat and I will look through some places with you. What type of accommodation are you looking for? Well, obviously, I need somewhere quite cheap but I don't really know much about the kind of places which are available. Perhaps you can tell me about some. Right. I'll start with self-contained flats. Now, these are the most expensive option out of the list I have here. You'll usually have to sign a tenancy agreement of some sort and pay a deposit and one month's advance rent. Although the flats are expensive, you'll find you have your freedom to do what you want. Are there any other kinds of place? Well, let's see. If you still want your freedom, you could try bedsitters. With this, you would have to share the kitchen and bathroom. Aren't there any places where I could get meals? There are lodgings. Here you will receive breakfast and sometimes half board. That is breakfast and evening meal. You would usually pay your rent weekly to a landlord who lives on the premises. Lodgings are usually more expensive than bedsitters as you receive a meal. There are also hostels, which are very similar in price to lodgings. Would I have my own kitchen facilities then? No, you usually have to share. You could try looking through the local paper for a flat or a house share. Or why don't you try the accommodation office on your university? I didn't know there was one. Yes, and they might get you a room in the halls of residence with other students. You share a kitchen and washing facilities with the other students. Also, they may be able to offer you a list of other cheap accommodation in the area. That's your best option. Thank you for your help. Listening activity number 14. You are going to listen to a talk about Cambridge. First, look at the notes below and questions 8 to 11. As you listen, fill in the gaps and answer questions 8 to 11. Now listen to the talk. Just one hour north of London lies the university city of Cambridge, which, for 700 years, has been one of the world's most important centres of learning. The academic vitality of the city and its sheer physical beauty combined to produce 
the perfect atmosphere in which to study. Like the other students here, you will enjoy privileges which are unique to the Cambridge way of life. During your free time, you might like to wander along the backs, the lawns which slope gently down to the River Cam, or try your hand at punting on the river itself. Equally relaxing is a cycle ride through the town centre. Here you can practice your English in the charming old marketplace. Meet other students in a traditional English pub, or pay a visit to one of the city's world-renowned museums. Afterwards, if you are still feeling energetic, there are facilities for every kind of sport. Although London is only a short journey away, Cambridge will tempt you with entertainments of its own. You can watch Britain's finest actors and musicians in performance, see the latest films. Or dine in one of Cambridge's excellent restaurants. In addition, the university social functions provide the perfect chance to make new friends and improve your English at the same time. Listening activity number fifteen. You are going to hear a talk about skunks. As you listen, fill in the gaps in the notes below, and then indicate whether the following statements are true or false. Now listen to the talk. If you ask people which animals they hate or fear the most, chances are you'll hear the following: skunks, bats, snakes, and rats. But some of these animals are gaining new respect. Most people fear the skunks because of their awful smell, for example. But recently, people have begun to rethink their ideas about skunks. Skunks are very useful animals, says animal researcher Cherry Briggs. They catch rats and mice and beetles. They're great for pest control. Skunks are very fair. They always warn you before they spray. They raise their tails and stamp their front feet. It's also good to know that you can spot a skunk before it sees you. We recognise the skunk by its white stripe, but skunks are very near-sighted and can't see more than three feet ahead. So if you pay attention to the skunk's warning signs and move away, you probably won't get sprayed. Most people would not be too pleased if a skunk moved in under their house, and here is some advice on how to get rid of the creatures. First of all, skunks hate rap music, so if you play loud rap music, skunks generally will move away from your house after a few hours. Also, they love cheese, especially cheddar, so you can just put some cheese a few feet away from your house. When the skunk leaves to get the cheese, block the holes so it can't get back in. But mostly, skunks just want to be left alone to do their work, which is pest control. Some people who get rid of skunks now actually want them back. Listening activity number sixteen. You are going to hear a conversation between a new student and a former one. As you listen, fill the missing information in the notes below, and then indicate whether the following statements are true or false. Now listen to the conversation. The lecture was interesting. I really enjoyed it. Yes, indeed I agree. But I wonder, are you new here? Actually, yes. I'm a new student. I enrolled in the MA teaching program last week. Oh, really? Well, I don't want to boast, but I was in this program only two years ago after my degree. I joined the staff of London University. I see. Well, then you couldn't tell me something about this program, could you? I'd be only too glad to. What do you want to know? Well, what 
kind of assessment is there for this particular program? It's just that I haven't taken an exam for quite a long time, so I'm nervous about the course. Oh, take it easy. There's no need to worry at all. I was nervous too when I first came here, until I found that the course assessment emphasizes essays and seminar papers. This helped me to gain confidence in my academic work before the final examinations. How many papers are required before the finals? Five essays and about six short papers. Something like that. I see. That doesn't seem too bad. Did you enjoy the course? Yes, very much. I greatly appreciate the year that I studied here. At first I thought the course would be very theoretical, but in fact it was very practical and relevant to the actual teaching. It proved to be of great assistance to me in my education career. What about the teachers here? Oh, they're very helpful. Throughout my time as a student, the academic staff here were always approachable, encouraging and supportive. Well, that makes me feel much better. I'm sure you'll like studying here. You know, all my time spent in this university was a very happy one. I made many good friends and thoroughly enjoyed the student life on campus. The lecturer today is one of my good friends here. Oh, is she? Well, sorry, but I have got to leave now. I enjoyed talking with you. Thanks for your help. It's been nice talking with you too. Good luck. Listening activity number 17. You are going to listen to a doctor's talk. First, look at the following notes and questions 6 to 12. As you listen, complete the notes and answer the questions. Now, listen to the talk. In Western countries, many people have fatty deposits on the inside wall of their arteries. These deposits build up over a number of years, narrowing the arteries. Sometimes the deposits can stimulate the formation of blood clots. If a clot breaks free, it can enter the circulation and sooner or later it will become trapped and block off a blood vessel, possibly causing a heart attack or a stroke. When researchers looked at the fatty deposits, they found they contained huge amounts of a substance called cholesterol. Everyone has cholesterol in their blood, although often the amounts detected in heart disease victims are much greater. So what is the link between what you eat and the cholesterol in your blood? The answer seems to be that the amount and type of fat in your diet are crucial in determining the cholesterol level in your blood. Food contains two main types of fat. They are called saturated and unsaturated fats. Saturated fats are the baddies, raising blood cholesterol level, while unsaturated fats, called polyunsaturated, will help to lower it. Polyunsaturated fats also contain lots of essential fatty acids like linoleic acid, as their name suggests, essential fatty acids are vital for health and cannot be made by the body. We should try to reduce the amount of saturated fat we eat and partially replace it with polyunsaturated fats. Polyunsaturated fats are naturally found in some nuts and seeds like sunflower seeds and in oily fish like mackerel. Margarine and oils which contain a high proportion of polyunsaturated fats are clearly labelled as such. Products which are high in polyunsaturated are also low in saturated fats. Listening activity number 18. You're going to hear a talk about the city of Pompeii. As you listen, Fill in the gaps in the notes below 
and then indicate whether the statements are true or false. Now, listen to the talk. Today, many people who live in large metropolitan areas such as Paris and New York City leave the city in the summer. They go to the mountains or to the seashore to escape the city noise and heat. Over two thousand years ago, many rich Romans did the same thing. They left the city of Rome in the summer. Many of these wealthy Romans spent their summers in the city of Pompeii. Pompeii was a beautiful city. It was located on the ocean, on the Bay of Naples. In the year seventy-nine A.D., a young Roman boy who later became a very famous Roman historian was visiting his uncle in Pompeii. The boy's name was Pliny the Younger. One day, Pliny was looking up at the sky when he saw a frightening sight. It was a very large dark cloud. This black cloud rose high into the sky. Rock and ash flew through the air. What Pliny saw was the eruption, the explosion, of the volcano Vesuvius. The city of Pompeii was at the foot of Mount Vesuvius. When the volcano first erupted, many people were able to flee the city and to escape death. In fact, eighteen thousand people escaped the terrible disaster. Unfortunately, there was not enough time for everyone to escape. More than two thousand people died. These unlucky people were buried alive under the volcanic ash. The eruption lasted for about three days. When the eruption was over, Pompeii was buried under twenty feet of volcanic rock and ash. The city of Pompeii was buried and forgotten for one thousand seven hundred years. In the year seventeen forty-eight, an Italian farmer was digging on his farm. As he was digging, he uncovered a part of a wall of the ancient city of Pompeii. Soon, archaeologists began to excavate to dig in the area. As time went by, much of the ancient city of Pompeii was uncovered. Today, tourists come from all over the world to see the ruins of the famous city of Pompeii. Listening activity number nineteen. You will hear a dialogue about accommodation in the UK. As you listen, fill in the gaps in the notes below, and then answer the questions. Terry, who is from Australia, is talking to his friend Mary, who came to study history at Leeds University two years ago. He is asking her about accommodation. So, do you have to pay the rent weekly or monthly? Well, usually monthly, but sometimes weekly. If it's weekly, then you have to pay it in advance on a fixed day of the week. Then, if you want to leave, you have to tell your landlady or landlord one week in advance on the day of the week on which you pay your rent. All、oh, right, so that's one week's notice. What about monthly payment? Uh, if you pay your rent monthly, you usually have to give one month's notice. But if you have furnished accommodation, or you don't get any meals, then legally you have to give one month's, even if you're paying weekly. So it is really important to have a definite arrangement with your landlady at the beginning of your tenancy. So you know the exact amount of notice you have to give. The same applies to the landlady if she wants you to leave. She has to give you either a week or a month's notice, whatever she decided. You usually have to pay a deposit too. If you do, you should make sure that you know exactly what it is for. So I have to pay a deposit whenever I move to a new place, then. Yeah. Most landladies ask for a deposit against damage, or in lieu of notice. What do you mean? You know, if you have to leave without giving the required amount of warning, or sometimes the deposit's on the key, which is returnable when you give it back when you come to leave. That sounds fair enough. You should really get a receipt for any deposit you pay. 
because it'll probably say what it's for. Oh, and you should also make sure that you have a rent book or some sort of receipt for your rent. If your landlady doesn't give you one, get one yourself and make sure that she signs it when you pay. Why is that? Well, you know, some students have had some trouble with paying their rent. Sometimes the landlady may say that you didn't pay or something. So it is good to have a rent book to have proof. Okay, so that's pretty important. Yes, and quite often there are house regulations written in the back of the rent book or sometimes displayed somewhere in the house. They may well be a part of your contract of tenancy, so make sure you check them. What happens if I want to share a room with a friend? Will that be allowed? Well, if you have a single room, it should only be used by one person. If you want to share, you have to ask your landlady's permission, so it really depends on her. Do I have to sign any contract or agreement with the landlady? Yeah, sometimes, especially if you're living in self-contained accommodation. Make sure you read it really carefully, as it'll be legally binding, and you'll have to pay rent for as long as the agreement says. You can get legal advice if you're not sure about anything. Oh, and get a copy of it too. Okay, thanks for your help. It'll be really useful, I'm sure. Listening activity number 20. You are going to listen to a conversation between two students. As you listen, complete the following notes and answer the questions. Now listen to the conversation. I hear you live in lodgings. How do you get on with your landlady? Oh, really well actually. Yeah? I'm thinking of taking lodgings. Have you got any tips on living with a landlady or landlord? Well, basically I just try to fit in with the customers of household. So right at the beginning, you should find out when meals are served and be punctual for them. British people seem to get quite annoyed if you are late for the dinner table. What about having friends round? Yeah, it's a good idea to ask your landlady when the most convenient times are and also for things like having a bath or receiving telephone calls. If you know you're going to be late for a meal or late home at night, you should let her know so she can save your dinner or give you a key. Do I have to do any housework? No, no, you don't have to at all. But I'm sure your landlady would be really glad if you kept your part of the house clean and tidy and made your own bed, things like that. Of course, if you live in your own flat, You'll have to do the housework yourself. What about gas or electricity? Is that included in the rent? Sometimes, but usually it's an extra charge in lodgings. There'll be a meter, which you have to put coins into. Oh, I've never seen one before. How do you use it? Well, they vary quite a bit. You'll have to ask about how exactly it works. You may have to use some extra blankets. Not all places have central heating and bedrooms can get pretty cold in the winter. Oh no, I can't stand the cold. Oh, it's not too bad. If it's really cold, you can buy a hot water bottle to warm the bed up before you get in. It would be very expensive to heat your bedroom throughout the night. Good idea. I'll get myself a hot water